So what I'll start out with is some things we did very early on. At high electric field uh, microwave fields, we're talking about kilovolts for microseconds. Then we'll talk about some things that are a little lower down, and then we'll talk about some of the experiments that we've done that I think will be the most interest to you. Then some stuff, and I would ask the press not anybody to report some of the stuff that I give you on DC fields because the pa scientific paper is not out yet, and I want to protect my students in terms of being able to do it, but I think you'll find it interesting. Then we'll talk a little bit about physics to chemistry. I don't think we have much time to do much of that. I think there's a clear need, as I've just stated, to establish thresholds where we understand when we've got something and when we don't. And I, the, you have experiments and papers that show effects, and you have experiments and papers that don't show effects. And what I think is one of the key things that's lacking is experiments that show you I have effects at these levels under these conditions, and if I go down, change the parameters, I don't have effects at these levels. We need to know where, how you define these boundaries if we're going to understand what's going on. All right, and then the difference between health effects and biological effects. Stress can be positive and negative, and maybe some philosophy towards risk if we have it a little farther down. I don't know how far we'll get. All right, here's some high power short, pay, short pulses. We applied uh, something like 10 kilovolts for, for microseconds. These are mitochondria where the M is. And this, when the average safety standard was set at 30 minute exposures for periods of an hour, or, or periods of 30 minutes or an hour, average exposure, clearly a single or two or three microwave pulses in the microsecond region like this, it clearly tears up the membrane cells. And this was clearly within the standards at that time which didn't have any limits on peak power. All right, oh, excuse me. All right, here's some big ex experiments that Howard Wachtell and I did looking on pacemaker cells in a plesia. And you can see that it was beating nice and regularly. And if you look down towards the bottom here, we wind up applying a, a microwave pulse and the, thing, and the pacemaker slows down. Now, if you heat cells slowly, the, it speeds up. And we were scrambled around for five years, not trying to figure out what was wrong or what was the explanation. We figured we may not know the mechanisms and the details, but we at least ought to have things going in the right direction. Turns out that we discovered in terms of our lab that the rate of change of temperature makes a difference as well as the temperature. And if we were getting changes in temperature as the order of a fraction or a half a degree to a degree per second, we got exactly the opposite effect that we got if you heat the thing slowly. And it turns out you can do the calculation, and there are two different ways of doing it. One is if you did it, it took me all of 20 minutes once it tumbled to the idea to come up with an explanation that might work, in spite of the fact we'd kicked this around for five years and the equations had been sitting in front of me the whole time, and I didn't know whether to jump for joy or kick myself in the tail. <laughs> tumbled it. But if you do the calculation on potassium currents, you'll find out that you hyperpolarize the cell if you change the temperature rapidly. And this will give you an, a, a negative bias or of about 2 tenths of a millivolt, which is enough to change the behavior of this. And we were able to duplicate that in some work that was not ever published for various reasons, both because Howard Wachtell and I are pretty bad about some of this stuff. And the student graduated and left before we got things through the review process. But we could get the same thing with a bolus of hot water if we pumped uh, a pulse of hot water past our cells. We got exactly the same thing as we got with a microwave exposure. All right, so this is at what I would call an intermediate level. If we go on farther, here are some experiments that we've done at 900 megahertz and whatnot. What we did basically is we put down a, a stripe of cyclic AMP, then we put down a known quantity of blood plasma where we had centrifuged the cells and extracted the white blood cells from the Buffy coat and slide it over. And we established a concentration gradient that we know how to calculate. And then we exposed it with a system that was not ideal, but we didn't expect to see anything. So we did, I didn't worry too much about setting this up in a way where we had precise measurements of the field exposures, because we didn't expect to see anything. Here's the calculation for the concentration gradients of the cyclic AMP as a function of time and position. You don't want to 
worry through that. These equations are messy. I didn't even put them up. And here's what we observe with the motion of neutrophils. If there's no chemical gradient there, basically these cells wander around. This is a period of 20 minutes. On the other hand, if we get them in a chemotactic gradient, you start, and this is, I'm cutting out quite a lot of slides, but basically you can get the cells to climb up along the concentration gradient like somebody climbing a hill. When we turn the microwaves on, or turn on 900 megahertz at, uh, at approximately four tenths of a volt per meter by one calculation, and that number is not good, you notice the cells go at right angles. Take it off, and they go back, go back up the concentration gradient. This is uh, the clearest data that I know of with respect to the fact that we have things occurring at levels where the temperature is calculated to be microdegrees. Thermal time constant for relaxation is about 250 microseconds. All right? Here's the other thing. So we had and the changes in direction about 70% of the time. Now, you've heard about tough professors, right? Well, my students on this stuff have got to give blood, right? <laughs> because I can, we can get approval to draw blood and test human subjects a lot easier than I can work with mice. The second thing that this data shows, the top curve is what happens when we've exposed these to RF fields at 900 megahertz. The bottom curve is the same thing with the temperature. There is no way in the region around 37 degrees to get to the velocity that we were measuring with the heat alone. Again, this works only about 70% of the time, and the other time it doesn't work at all. And this is the same student drawing blood from the same student on successive days. All right, we don't know what the situation that's changed on this. It may be what they had for dinner. Maybe they're stressed out over a test coming in. Maybe they got a fight with their girlfriend or their boyfriend. I have no idea what the cause is, is why sometimes we get results and sometimes we don't. But we get this about 70% of the time. It took us a couple of years to get this paper published in a very much reduced form. And we spent something like an additional year trying to pin down the details to deal with as many of the arguments as we could. All right. This circulated in one journal. And I know the editor well and whatever and basically said this is never going to get published, so we wound up putting it in another journal. All right. Anyway, this is a summary of the data we have. That should be 0 0.4 volts per meter with one calculation. There's another calculation there and what needs to be done at 4 volts per meter. But that uh, it doesn't really make any difference. Both those numbers are small. And uh, what needs to be done is a good computer calculation that, that, that calculates out the boundary value problem because you can't measure this very well. All right. The estimated rise in temperature was less than 10 to the minus 4 degrees. And our, our measurements showed less than a tenth of a degree. So here is, to me at least, because it's done in my own lab, I believe it more than I believe some of the others. And I admit to being prejudiced about this is data that says we've got non-thermal effects. Now, this is a biological effect. It's not necessarily a health effect. And one needs to be careful about the distinction between these two. I'm interested in how do you go from the physics to the chemistry, from the chemistry to the biology, and what are the steps in between? And I don't think we're going to know the answer to some of the questions people have raised here with regard to what is the wave shape that's important? What is the adaptive response report? Do we have allergic reactions to to electric and magnetic fields. I don't think these things have been studied well. And I think they're well within the range of possibility of things. It's pretty clear that if we use the cell phone once, we all don't drop dead. So that's it's not clearly we get that kind of an acute reaction. But what happens over long term, low level exposures, I don't know. And the, the easy part is the electrical engineering and the physics part. The hard part is what the biology is. We can give you pretty good maps of what fields are where under what conditions. What I don't know is what the effect is on the biology. All right. Uh, 